Are you, are you able to um, turn off the camera and just have the, the microphone lit up just to see if that makes a difference? So, um, like how I, would I do that? I, in Zoom, I think you have the you have the option there to actually okay. just toggle off your camera. Off video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Can you talk a little bit more? Yeah. Um, am I okay now? No. It's it's not it's a little bit better, but not 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 that great yet. Okay. Usually the, ca um, the camera takes up a little bit of bandwidth, so I thought maybe disabling your camera, we can uh, save some more bandwidth for your audio, but it doesn't seem like it's making too much of a difference. Is there anybody else in your house on the computer? You, we can turn the camera back on. Yeah, I want to start the broadcast. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. I think what we're going to do is um, we're just going to continue with the presentation. I'll, I'll try when we get to your section um, to see whether or not there's any improvement. Uh, if there's not, I think um, we might just get Donna or, uh, or Caitlin to, to jump in. Why it's not working? Last time I used it, it wasn't that bad. Not that bad. And I gave the last time. Okay. So that's going to allow people to start joining in. All right. How am I going to um, know when you start the broadcast so I can start talking? I'm going to click this button right here. Okay. You don't have to start the meeting yet. We still have a minute. Okay. So I'll just have to. Okay. Is that better? And then seven o'clock. Is that better? Is that any better? Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Bit. It's better? Yeah. It's a little bit better, yeah. I think it's that key. Still on time. So you guys, if it's not good if it's not good from your end, how will you let me know so I can stop talking and somebody okay. can kick in? Leslie, we're, we're live now, so we're, um, I'm just going to go ahead, and then we'll try when we get there, and I'll introduce Donna or uh, Caitlin if we need to. Okay. So good evening. Uh, my name is Selena Campbell. I'm Acting Director for Municipal Enforcement Services, and welcome to our, our Town of Oakville virtual public meeting, where we will be discussing uh, living with wildlife. Tonight's session will be focused on coyotes. Then if we can get the presentation. Thank you. So tonight, we hope to improve your confidence and comfort level in coexisting with coyotes by discussing the science of coyotes along with the town's coyote program. This will be an interactive session where you can submit questions. If you're signed in as a participant, you can enter your questions through the Q&A. If you're watching online, you can call the number that will be provided during the question period set up after each presentation. On our panel today, we have town representatives from Municipal Enforcement and Climate Action, as well as our external partners from Coyote Watch Canada and the Oakville Humane Society. Specifically today, we have with us Donna Hales, Acting Manager of Climate Action, Caitlin Jones, Manager of Animal Services at the Oakville Humane Society, and Leslie Sampson, Founding Executive Director of Coyote Watch Canada. I will begin our first presentation on the Coyote Program in Oakville. So the town regularly updates its coyote program to reflect best practices. 
In 2019, management of the town's Coyote Coexistence Program was shifted to the Municipal Enforcement Department. This provided opportunity for more boots on the ground resources to support the community through education and outreach, investigations based on community reports, and neighborhood specific education. In our efforts to create an environment where residents can feel safe and confident coexisting with wildlife, we utilize a number of tools, including the Coyote Reporting Form, municipal bylaws, investigations conducted by municipal enforcement officers, access to our external partners such as Coyote Watch Canada, Oakville Green, and the Ministry of Natural Resources, installation of signage in parks and trails to alert patrons of the presence of coyotes, distribution of flyers to neighborhoods, and the regular updates on our website, as well as the use of social media. The successful coexistence of people, pets, and wildlife will take participation from the community and government agencies alike. Each partner involved in this group plays an important, important role in working towards this balance. The town helps to facilitate these roles, so our community receives the support needed with a focus on understanding what's required to coexist with wildlife. The town has identified the following groups who have a role to play in wildlife management. Firstly, the town of Oakville, the Oakville Humane Society, property owners and residents, external agencies such as Coyote Watch Canada and Oakville Green, the Ministry of Natural Resources, and Halton Regional Police. We'll go through uh, the groups and what they're responsible for. So residents and property owners play a key role in the program by managing wildlife and coyote activity on their own properties, removing attractants from, uh, for wildlife and coyotes, and educating members of their household. The Oakville Humane Society is contracted through the town and assists with attending to sick and injured animals, including coyotes, enforcement of town bylaws related to domestic pets, this includes pets off leash, removal of dead animals from public roadways, public education and outreach. We also have external partners, which the town engages to assist with scientific expertise, community education and hazing, and some investigations. The role of the Ministry of Natural Resources is to support the town by providing provincial policy and legislation and educational materials. It's important to note that the Ministry of Natural Resources does not lead investigations or provide trapping services of wildlife or coyotes. Finally, Halton Regional Police Services also plays a role in our program by responding to immediate threats to personal safety. The Coyote Program in Oakville relies on a partnership of all groups described in order to create a successful alliance between the community and the environment where they live, and this includes wildlife and coyotes. Education and understanding is the cornerstone of this program. We focus on prevention. Our program is about preventing the escalation so that we don't have to address aggressive interactions. By creating, uh, by creating community that keeps wildlife uh, wild and by empowering residents to feel confident in hazing when needed. The new procedure provides for best practices to deter coyotes from approaching people in private property, lays out various responsibilities that the town or other community partners will take to respond to various incidents. To report the new Coyote Education and Response Program, please visit the town's website at oakville.ca. Seeing a coyote is not necessarily a cause for alarm. There are things we can do to deter coyotes from entering our pro private property and residential neighborhoods. As previously noted, this program is focused on prevention to avoid escalation for a negative interaction. To describe what normal behavior is for wildlife, we'll start with a resident seeing a coyote on a street or on a homeowner's front lawn. In some instances, you may see a coyote follow you. These reports are tracked, compiled to establish patterns or trends in a neighborhood. Public outreaches such as flyer distribution or assistance with hazing techniques may be offered by enforcement staff to local residents. A more in-depth investigation will be launched as the interaction escalates. With interaction uh, for biting pet or pets that have bitten, been bitten, in these instances, flyers are distributed, officers are asked to speak to residents to answer questions and offer tips about hazing techniques, 
and to keep coyotes at a distance from their families and pets. External partners such as Coyote Watch may be engaged to assist with the investigation. In extreme cases of reports of biting a human, immediate investigation would be conducted and a decision may be made to capture the coyote and that may be in, sorry, that may be involved and it may end in the destruction of that animal. As you can see, the type of report will trigger the town's level of response. The new procedure defines different types of reports. As mentioned earlier, the strategy employs an escalated strategy starting with sightings. Provide information on the town's website about normal coyote behavior. Responsible pet ownership and hazing techniques are your best practices to address anything that's concerning. Moving next to dens. Again, normal uh, coyote habitat uh, left in place is best. If pups are present, installed will on, and the den is found on town property, we will install temporary signage to secure the area with, and secure the area with caution tape. We'll distribute information to the neighborhood and engage the community partners. Please note that property owners are responsible for dens on their own property and must act in accordance with all applicable provincial and municipal regulations. The actions undertaken by the, town's es by the town escalates with the following reports. So physical interaction with a pet. The response to this type of report is to gather information on the incident. Coyote Watch Canada may be contacted to assist in the investigation. Penalties may be issued for violations. There will be a focused neighborhood response and educational campaign. Physical interaction or biting a human. This report type would trigger notification to the CAO, Halton Regional Public Health, the Ministry of Natural Resources, and we will work with our partner agencies to investigate and attempt to locate the animal and humanely eliminate the responsible coyotes, test for rabies, and given a full necropsy to determine the general health. Trapping of a coyote is very difficult, and this cannot always be achieved. If a per person is bitten by a coyote, they should contact 911 uh, if needed and submit a medical report. The reporting tool serves as a multi-use tool. So what you see before you is on our, the Town of Oakville website. So it provides a resident with an opportunity to submit their coyote interactions and view other submissions via the online map. It also provides staff with the opportunity to investigate more serious reports of coyote interactions. Please note that the dots represent individual interactions but do not reflect the number of coyotes. Even with the increased number of reports, we must remember that many reports likely involve the same coyote. Whether it be several reports submitted on the same day or in the same area, uh, there are reports or su reports submitted by the same person. The data from this will will assist in identifying the response to be taken based on the type of report. As noted in the coyote response strategy, staff will respond according to the report type and may include distribution of flyers, installation of signage, updating to close, uh, updating garbage uh, systems to have closed lids in parks. Uh, there may be uh, additional signage or neighborhood uh, pamphlets. The response from the town will increase based on the strategy and will include more in-depth investigations related to den sites or interaction with domestic pets or people. The main objective of the Coyote program in Oakville is to support the community living with wildlife. The program encourages coexistence of people, pets, and wildlife through education and prevention. Through the town's program, the town does not promote the removal of, of coyotes and wildlife. Removal and trapping is not an active part of the program. There are several reasons for this. Traps pose a risk to pets and people. Use of firearms is permitted, except for uh, police services. By removing coyotes from their territory, there's a void that's created, which makes room for outside coyotes to fill the territory. This would simply replace the number of coyotes which had already been present in the community. The new coy coyotes in the territory could bring new disease, which were not, was not present formally. And we would just be transferring the issue to another neighborhood. 
As mentioned earlier in the presentation, the town's coyote program works within a framework of managing coyotes on municipal land, policy and legislation, enforcement of property standards and feeding bylaws, management tools and programs including coordination and reporting, investigating of reported den sites and, coyote, uh, and coyotes approaching within two meters, and public education. So at this point, we'll move to questions. So we would like to take a moment to invite members of the public to submit questions they have, either by calling in or if you're an attendee to the meeting, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. We'll be looking uh, to answer questions, but if you don't hear your question asked, it's likely because it will be addressed later in the presentation. So at this stage, I think we did have one uh, question that was submitted earlier. So the question is, how do you suggest someone on a mobility scooter be prepared to haze a coyote? So this is an excellent question. And I think hazing, uh, actually, if I will try to connect to, um, to Leslie with Coyote Watch Canada to see if she's prepared to, to respond to this. If not, I will prepare a response for you. So at this time, uh, I will provide that, that response. So mobility scooters themselves are going to provide a certain amount of concern to a coyote just because it's something that they're not familiar with and it's going to make an odd sound. In addition to that, you really want to have um, a degree of confidence when you're dealing with, with a wild animal to, to show them that essentially you're boss. You can use your voice, you can wave your arms, you can make yourself as big as you can in order to, uh, to deter the coyote. And oftentimes you'll be able to scare them away. Okay, do we have any other questions? All right, so there's no other questions at this time. So our next presentation is from Leslie Sampson of Coyote Watch Canada. Leslie co-founded Coyote Watch Canada in 2008 after coordinating a decade-long community-based initiative. During the project, as a volunteer, Leslie facilitated and led a community conflict resolution and outreach uh, for the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. As a certified secondary educator, she taught diverse subjects such as geography, science, literacy, and tourism. Leslie's research and focus is on coyote behavior and non-lethal coexistence methodologies. She has consulted across North America. Her extensive fieldwork capabilities are valued through the scientific and government agencies including citizen stakeholders for her experience and uh, mitigation techniques both in the field and in the advocacy table. Through her leadership as Executive Director for Coyote Watch Canada, Leslie and her science advisory and Kenya, Ken, sorry, Canid response teams have collaborated with the University of Manitoba, Toronto, and Guelph. She continues fostering community coexistence partnerships and human coyote dimensions and land use research through Queens. Tonight, Leslie will offer insights into the coyote human dynamics, the Eastern coyote family structure, and the human canid coexistence. Please welcome Leslie. Thank you so much, Selena. I hope everybody can hear me. Does we can. sound pretty good? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you, Leslie. You can go ahead. Perfect. Uh, so the slide, the first slide, thank you. And we can just go right in into the next slide. Thank you. So uh, thank you folks for joining us tonight. This is a basic outline of what I'll be covering. And Selena did a really great job of uh, outlining what I'll be speaking to tonight. Uh, one of the um, key points, though, is really emphasizing uh, the importance of having that community program and everybody being engaged and, and contributing in a meaningful way. Next slide, please. And so our coexistence framework is somewhat similar to most of the municipalities that we do partner with. But what's uh, different about Coyote Watch Canada program is that we do have canine response teams. And so they work in partnership uh, with various municipalities and uh, agencies 
but also uh, complement and support um, the experts that are already in place in a community. And so the partnership building and conflict resolution, that's all collaborative with government agencies that are already in place, such as, uh, you know, city bylaw and also the humane societies and any other organizations that are involved um, with beyond the ground. And that also includes science and education and the coexistence program. Thank you. Next slide. And so our, our framework involves investigation, enforcement, prevention, and education. And we look to that coyote species, the eastern coyote, as the eco-thermometer. And we can gauge uh, pretty quickly where, where things are at in terms of all of those four cornerstones. But all of them need to be met for a program to work. And thankfully, um, you know, the program with... Uh, Oakville is amazing because it covers all of those. And so um, why is the mapping important? That essentially is a snapshot of where there is activity within the community. And it allows for the deployment of investigation or the canine response team to help residents and support in terms of um, ensuring that attractants are removed. We also um, feel very strongly that the mapping is important too because it, it also uh, allows for agencies to be able to look at community and where there's infrastructure change. We can almost anticipate that there'll be a shift in where and how coyotes are navigating through the system. And Oakville, with, within the program of Oakville, it's Fabulous because residents can also have that snapshot view and, and understand where coyote activity is. Thank you. Next slide. So, uh, Leslie, I think we're having a little bit of difficulty. So, uh, I'll ask Donna, I think, to jump in and, and see if she can sure. assist as we move forward. I just don't want anybody to miss okay. all the important information you're providing. So everybody, uh, please welcome Donna Hales. Uh, thanks, Selena, and uh, apologies because Leslie does a great job with this. She's got a lot of experience, um, but I will try and jump in. Uh, as manager of climate action, we do have a lot of uh, experience in handling biodiversity, in working with wildlife, uh, dealing with wildlife conflict. Uh, and I was uh, heavily involved with the Coyote program previously, so uh, hopefully I can do justice to Leslie's presentation. So education, science, and coexistence. So facts versus fiction. Next, please. Can you? Ah. Um, this is something that actually is, is very interesting. Um, a lot of the time, coyotes uh, get we have to separate the fact from the fiction. So people are understandably nervous, uh, afraid, concerned when they see something that looks like a large wild dog that is on the trail with them and they're not used to it. And especially with the kinds of uh, media and the way that it's talked about, uh, we hear a lot of words like aggressive, uh, attacks, and very sensationalistic type of uh, words associated when we discuss coyotes. The reality, though, is that the actual risk, if we look at the science, is extremely low. On average, in Canada, we have about one and a half bites or scratches uh, across Canada per year that are significant, uh, which is quite low. Um, and the chances of getting uh, an injury if you are a human from a coyote is incredibly low. Um, so we have to start to look at that, uh, separating our feelings from the actual facts. Uh, investigation is the key for success, and that's something that the town is very committed to and is working with uh, Coyote Watch Canada, uh, so that when there is any sort of uh, what appears to be an escalation or community concern, we start to look at what the facts are and try and dig through that and make sure that what is actually happening on the ground is something, if that's a risk, or if it's just something that's maybe a perceived risk, which is a big difference. Um, so with media alerts, again, 
when you're reading that kind of information, like anything, and to be honest, even with what we're seeing with COVID-19, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of false information, and it's never been more important to really put a critical eye to what you're reading and understanding. So that's the same with coyotes. And so that is really a skill that we would encourage everybody to develop, critical thinking and looking at uh, media for, for what's actually behind the story and the words. Um, good relations with law enforcement and media play a critical role. We're fortunate in Oakville. We work very closely with the Oakville Beaver, for example, and local media outlets um, so that we have a balanced presentation uh, so that we get the facts to them. And they do a great job of making sure that that information is ground truth and that they are not just putting the first thing uh, you know, onto the page that will probably get the most airplay. Um, for social media, again, uh, public needs to scrutinize the origins of things. And Oakville, again, has a really great social media program around coyotes. Uh, we do have regular postings and information and links to valid, credible sources. So again, uh, this is a picture of a coyote. If you were to look at it, you see the teeth. Uh, it looks like something scary. You wouldn't want to see this. This is actually a coyote that was, I believe his name was Patches, and this is where Leslie's uh, sort of experience is, uh, would have been helpful. But I do know a little bit about this story. So Patches was a coyote that was highly habituated. It was being fed every day. Um, and actually, this coyote was playing, and this was very much, a, I guess, the equivalent of a smile for coyotes. He was relaxed. He was enjoying himself. So this is actually a, a non-aggressive coyote right here. And this is probably something I know myself, I've seen this quite frequently on the internet. This is something that's made its rounds. I believe I've heard something like a, a million uploads or a million views of this, uh, of this has been seen. So again, you're looking at that. It looks like an attack on a dog. Uh, and this is usually sent out with saying that coyotes try and lure dogs uh, out, especially during mating season, and that they are doing that to attack them, which, if you're a wild animal or anybody, the chances like th that that does not make sense. If you look at it critically, why would a coyote want to put itself at risk by luring another animal into a fight? Um, so what actually was happening? This is the full picture. If you saw it from behind, uh, so this coyote was trapped. It was being attacked by multiple dogs, and it was defending itself. So again, there's usually a lot more to the story, and we again we encourage some critical thinking around this. So Busting Myths 101, another piece of information that people uh, get caught up in is, again, language. And when you hear the word coy wolf which or coy dog, it starts to evoke different sorts of feelings than if you just say eastern coyote. And to be honest, eastern coyote is a much more accurate term, and that's the more commonly used one um, scientifically. And again, it's, it, it's uh, based on the fact that coyotes are not going and breeding with wolves regularly at, at this point in time. Uh, the origins of the coyotes that we see here, the eastern coyote, uh, is that well over 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I guess, um, coyotes started uh, getting displaced in the southwest, which is where they're native to. And they started getting bumped out by uh, development. And as they moved north, they ended up in Ontario uh, and the south uh, sort of southern part of Canada and the eastern seaboard uh, across North America. And there was uh, eastern wolves, which they ended up coming across during that time. There was some interbreeding, but it's actually not that easy for a wolf to breed with a coyote, just because there's a lot of scientific information behind that. I won't get into it. But uh, their mating cycles and that sort of thing it's not that easy for a coyote to breed with a wolf. So this did happen. Um, that's the only wolf species, actually, the eastern wolf, that a coyote, western coyote, can breed with. Uh, so those offspring uh, then ended up in, in eastern, uh, the eastern seaboard. And what you see now are this hybridized animal that has been in existence for well over 100 years. Wolves are nowhere in the area anymore for the most part, um, so we don't have them interbreeding anymore. And really, they're predominantly, the, the predominant uh, genetics that they've looked into 
is Western coyote. So you still have that. Uh, they're not particularly a pack animal, which I'll get into later. They hang out more with their family groups, but they, they exhibit all of the same patterns, for the most part, of a Western coyote, which is not, uh, not aggressive. They will run because they do tend to be more of a lone animal. Uh, so if you just think of it, again, from a logical point of view, an animal that can't depend on a pack like a wolf is going to be a lot less uh, risky or, ri or they're going to be risk averse because if anything happens to it, it doesn't have another pack animal to look after it. It's on its own. If it gets injured, nobody's going to get it food. So they do tend, that's why they do tend to be shy and you can uh, haze coyotes. That's why you can uh, get them uh, so that they're not as, they're not as aggressive as, as wolves. So they really don't exhibit those sorts of, of traits. Um, won't get, this is just uh, the, the sort of the scientific background behind that. Won't get into the details. Uh, we've just sort of gone over that there. And the other piece too is that people often think that coyotes are uh, much larger than they are. This is a really great uh, sort of representation where we see what the size of a cat, uh, average fox. And you can see here the coyote in black with the, uh, the silhouette there. It's actually smaller than most uh, average sized dogs. So a Labrador retriever is twice the size or twice the weight of a coyote. Uh, and again, wolves are significantly bigger as well. The, way, the reason that coyotes look so much bigger is that they've got really big rib cages and they're high up. They've got tall uh, legs or long legs and they're very uh, bushy. So it, they do give the appearance of looking much larger than they actually are. The average one is anywhere between about 30 to about 45 pounds around here. So coyotes are uh, actually beneficial in many cases and there are also social benefits. Um, while we do know that uh, there are very divided opinions about coyotes, uh, there are people who really do enjoy having them here. Uh, there are certain elements of ecotourism around that. Um, you know, and cultural connection, and, and people really do enjoy seeing them. There's certainly a, a, an element of the population that does that. Uh, they do fill an ecological niche. Uh, just one example, locally, I know, speaking with one of our um, environmental groups, the years when we did have, tend to have uh, lower coyote numbers because of mange, which is a disease that does tend to kill them off, uh, we had very high rabbit populations and all the work that they did planting uh, new trees that year, they lost almost everything uh, because there were so many rabbits that uh, the coyotes weren't able to, to maintain because the, the coyotes had died, the pile population had uh, died back significantly. Um, there's also a lot of uh, good scientific research going on. They do uh, certainly give us a lot of information about uh, uh, many other canids and uh, uh, it's also biocontrol for geese. Uh, that was studied by Urban Coyote Research in Chicago, which has an excellent program headed by Stanley Garrett. Uh, so they, uh, do maintain, or they do control geese. Uh, they're also a keystone species that influences rodent populations. So again, we certainly have issues with uh, small rodents in Oakville. That would be significantly worse if we did not have animals such as coyotes and foxes uh, keeping some of those populations in check. So another piece that uh, people sometimes uh, get concerned about and they think that there are packs of, of coyotes uh, howling that they have uh, just attacked some, some new animal uh, is the noise. And the way that coyotes use uh, vocalization is very complex. They have many different noises, and the way that they do that also can sound like there are many more of them than there actually are. Um, very detailed scientific research has gone on, and you know you can ask people, oh, how many coyotes are there? And they, they might think that there's at least six or seven more, and there's only two. Sometimes it's only one even, because they do have such a wide range of vocalizations. Uh, they use it um, not to announce predation. It's not a threatening kind of attack war cry. Uh, they usually use it, first of all, to warn off other coyotes. They use it to co or, uh, connect with other members of their family if they've got pups nearby uh, or members of their family that they want to uh, provide information to. So hearing a coyote, you, 
you're not likely to see, well, you're not going to see that there's a large pack of them. There may only be one or two, and it's not uh, an aggressive type of behavior. So a little bit about seasonal milestones, so what you can expect from coyotes throughout the year. One thing that's, uh, I think it's nice, it's uh, they are monogamous when left to thrive. So they do form uh, very stable family uh, groups. So uh, the male and the female will stay mated generally for life. And if a partner does pass away, uh, quite often that the one that's left will remain uh, single for the rest of its life as well. Sorry, just a sec, just need to make an adjustment for the mic. Thank you. So a um, little bit about the biology. So coyotes are capable of breeding within the first year. Generally, they don't. Um, they will uh, usually, uh, into the second year, um, they will sometimes stay with their family for that first year, which is why you sometimes see multiple uh, coyotes. It's not a pack, it's just a few family, a few children that have stayed behind a little bit longer than maybe they should, which I think we're all familiar with that sort of a scenario. Um, gestation for the female is 62 to 63 days. So this is kind of interesting. I know February 14th is actually, I've heard the, the pinnacle of coyote mating. Uh, so that's when you're most likely to have uh, coyotes uh, looking for mates and partnering. And then their uh, offspring are born generally a little, like April or so. Um, and you'll see some den building beginning around that time. Uh, so it's not always obvious what a den looks like. It'll be under tree roots sometimes. It'll be a mound of earth. It might even just be a little pile of brush. Uh, they are temporary, and they're just used for when they are having their pups. Um, and they'll often have an alternative den site within their home territory. Uh, although people think that it, diurnal activity is something that's common, and it usually is because if you think about where, how coyotes are the kind of food they traditionally eat, which is small mammals and small rodents, that's when those animals are most busy. So it would make the most sense they're going to go when the food is out. However, in urban areas, they've, they're very uh, adaptable. So coyotes will eat everything from garbage and fruit, uh, small mammals, which is still is their, their food of choice. Um, so they're, they're pretty flexible. So there's all of that food that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week in urban areas, which is why you will sometimes see them uh, during the day and they're not quite as uh, uh, fixed on dusk and dawn uh, as you might think at this point. Um, in stable territories, mated pair can have litters between two to 10 pups. On average, they have five. Uh, they do have a high mortality rate and once those pups are ready to leave, they do leave the territory. They don't generally stay uh, in that same area. So coyotes co-parent. Oh, I should also say too, in a stable environment, uh, coyotes will only breed once a year and they're only fertile for a small period of time, uh, which is just going back to why they don't breed very well with other dogs or, or other wolves. They only have one short period of time when they're fertile, and so trying to breed with them any other time will not result in pups. Um, so coyotes do co-parent, and that's another thing. Uh, they are very reliant on uh, having two parents to raise the pups. So if one of them is uh, killed, or if they breed with a wolf, uh, if, if that was done, they don't work that way, so the, the parent with the remaining coyote would have a very difficult time raising those pups on their own. They don't do well with that. Uh, so males bring back the food uh, and to the den for the nursing mother. Uh, they are usually fully weaned within six weeks of age. That's when you'll start seeing them walking around. And it's not uncommon for older siblings from previous litters to help with the pup rearing. So they those are those family units, and they don't stay together that much, that's like a loose association. Uh, but uh, they, again, they, they could stay around for a little bit of time and then they start to move off and find their own territory. Um, the parents do teach their pups. It's a very active uh, process. And again, that communication uh, with, through vocalizing, you'll probably hear that the most during that pupping season when they're communicating with their uh, young and then the young are starting to move away. Uh, they want to make sure that they're still connected. 
they're born with their eyes closed. And there's just uh, some pictures of, of pups in the den and what, uh, what coyote pups might look like. And so coyotes are curious, but again, they, are, uh, they tend to be more shy, which I know sounds a little bit odd with a lot of people here in Oakville, but that is their basic nature, and it's only when they're lured out by things such as food or other attractants that they start to lose some of those characteristics. So this is an example. The pups become fairly independent um, fairly early on, so they're exploring, they're learning their, uh, to, to make their way around. Uh, and the parents will have a rendezvous site. So after exploring and through those vocalizations, they'll bring the pups back uh, to have a rendezvous so that they all assemble and that they all have uh, that sort of comfort that they know that they're all together. So as mentioned, coyotes are adaptive omnivores. So what that means is that they are not fussy. Uh, they will eat uh, just about anything. Uh, that does not include people or any sort of uh, larger species like that, but it does mean that they will eat garbage. They, I've uh, read pieces where watermelon farmers in the southern states have had major concerns with coyotes because they will eat all of their watermelon crops. So that's what they survive on down there. They will eat bird seed that's been left scattered around, which is one of the reasons why we say make sure if you do have coyotes in your area, you should try and keep um, bird feeding to a minimum or make sure that it's all, always kept tidy. Uh, they will eat pet food that's left out. So all of these things are easily accessible and abundant in urban areas, which is why they do so well. Highly adaptable. Um, they have an excellent sense of smell and hearing. And again, their, their base diet is rodent populations and smaller mammals. That's where pets come in because a coyote sees a pet, a small dog particularly, or a small cat uh, that's left on its own. It doesn't know the difference between that and a rabbit. So coyotes are not being uh, purposely vicious or attacking these animals on purpose. It's just they don't see the, the difference. They will generally prefer an easier meal, such as a, a mouse or a rabbit. Uh, but if, that, if your pet is left on its own and it is completely unattended, that provides more of a, a, an appetizing meal because it's, it, it's not going to have to ha fight for that. But if you're nearby, if your pet is on a leash, if you are adjacent to your pet, and especially if you pick your pet up, that coyote is not going to be too inclined to, to go after your pet. Um, let's see, I've gone through all of the, the various foods that they eat. Um, they'll eat, uh, they'll scavenge on uh, carrion and dead, uh, and dead animals, so that's another positive uh, ecological benefit. Um, and they're skilled at connecting green spaces within their territories. So if you look at Oakville and how many connections and green spaces we have, which is wonderful, uh, it's great for people, it's also great for coyotes. Uh, so they will tend to stick to those green spaces and go through the corridors and move through those. There's also, we're fortunate that a lot of our residential areas have very large backyards, uh, unused green space that connects very nicely to the ravines. And again, coyotes are not seeing the difference between what's considered public land and ravines that they should be in versus sometimes uh, these larger spaces that are in some of our residential areas. And especially if there are attractants drawing them into those residential areas, that's where we're starting to see a lot more of those uh, encounters. So, um, they are very smart, extremely smart, uh, which is why they're so adaptable and why they've also been so successful in urban areas. So this is one particular case. I believe this was in Chicago. Um, so there was a, a, a coyote Gus teaching his five young pups how to cross a very busy road. So they, they learn very quickly how to navigate their environment and make the most of what they have there. Um, They'll also take advantage of things like railway corridors, hydro corridors, um, old roadways. 
uh, and of course trails. And things like uh, infrastructure changes, fencing, and loss of habitat can impact their movement patterns. So one example uh, just that was at, again, Oakville Trafalgar High School, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, this happened a few years ago. Uh, there were a lot of holes in some fencing that was around the school and around some of the residential areas. Uh, students had made some of the holes, I think, for easy access to, uh, to not have to walk around the long way. And those coyotes became there, that became problematic there. This one coyote uh, was found to be using those spaces very actively because people can get through. It's great for the coyote. It's an easy breezeway for him to go through as well. So um, why are we seeing these sorts of uh, encounters or what we're going to call like conflict uh, situations? It's largely because of the environment we have built. Um, people will often say that coyotes belong out in the countryside. Uh, research has consistently and very emphatically shown that coyotes actually do much better in urban areas now. We have created a perfect environment for these very adaptable animals. Um, there's no predators and uh, there's plenty of food and so they are, whether we love them, hate them, uh, we have to deal with them because they are not going anywhere and unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view, um, it's just something that we have to learn to um, coexist with, which is the whole basis of our program. It's uh, not a program that's based on uh, emotions, it's based on the facts and what we have to deal with uh, that's been uh, the situation and what nature basically has given to us. Um, so with habitat destruction, uh, that's a pretty common one, even just uh, in, in a micro scale. So if a coyote is uh, at, for example, an, a place that's been perhaps in, uh, not in use for a number of years, an abandoned building, and then there's redevelopment starting, uh, that coyote is going to be moved from an area that perhaps it wasn't causing any uh, problems for before because nobody saw it. And then it is forced out and then becomes much more visible as it's trying to find a new place to establish itself. Um, harassment by people and dogs is uh, another issue, particularly off leash. That's where we have a lot of problems. So what happens, again, these are intelligent animals and they're adaptable. And if they are consistently uh, exposed to off-leash dogs that are chasing them, attacking them, they're going to learn that dogs in general are a danger. So they may get a little bit more um, aggressive or nervous if a larger dog comes near them because their experience has been, this is an animal that I need to be afraid of. Generally, if they don't have pups, they will run. But if cornered or if they do have pups that they need to protect, that might uh, tend to escalate into a confrontation. So off-leash dogs, we are strongly encouraging people, please, if you want to de-escalate situations uh, in your neighborhood, please keep your dogs on leash. Uh, that helps to train the coyote not to be uh, as uh, afraid of those dogs and will tend to, to, to lessen the conflict potential. Uh, deliberate and indirect feeding uh, from both private and public sites. And again, this is an area that people think, well, who is going to feed a coyote? Uh, surprisingly, we have had a number of actual direct feedings, um, but more often than not, it is indirect, which means things like putting your composting out too early so the coyotes have a regular uh, food source there. Leaving your food pe or pet's food out is another issue. Um, even things we had uh, in the Woodside Library area a few years ago, we had some issues. And there were some significant uh, fruit numbers of fruit trees. And the coyotes, that was all they were eating was the fallen fruit. So even things like that, we really need to make sure that we're keeping things as tidy as we can in the areas that we don't want them, knowing that we do have to, they will exist here somewhere. So the whole role or the whole goal of the program is to keep them out of residential areas, more in our woodland areas, and keep those, and make sure that we tell the coyotes that by our behaviors and our actions, which means keeping attractants out and keeping your dogs uh, on, on leash and protected. Uh, Oakville does have an excellent uh, educational uh, resource 
that uh, support appropriate community response. Uh, municipal enforcement has uh, is now leading all of this, uh, and we also use community partners such as Coyote Watch Canada. Uh, we've also worked with Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, who also has some great resources now to really make sure that the community is supported and understands what they can do to keep themselves and their pets safe. Uh, again, it's primarily pets that we're concerned about because those are the ones that uh, we have had some issues with. People, despite uh, you know concerns and the way that people may emotionally feel about it, have not proven to have any uh, major incidents with coyotes. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Coyote wellness and behavior. So um, death disruption and fragmentation of the family. Um, so without, again, without parental care of both, pu most pups uh, will, will perish if they don't have two parents. Um, they will also tend to not learn the correct things and uh, their predation choices uh, may not be the best. So it's basically, if you think of any, anybody that does not ra is not raised by parents or not taught the proper things, you find your own way to do it, and those aren't always the best options. And those sorts of things can uh, lead to, to co or conflict. Um, social structure bonds and stability are compromised, and the risk of forced dispersal before uh, they're able to properly navigate uh, is also an issue. So again, this sort of comes to, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, why we don't trap or relocate. There's a lot of reasons for that. But uh, just from that perspective, it certainly is an issue. Uh, injury and illness, they are um, subject to uh, things such as poisons, uh, parvo, distemper. Uh, the big one is uh, mange in this area, which does come back uh, cyc cyclically, cyclically. Um, and that is when you start to see very mangy, uh, patchy, uh, sickly looking animals. And that's a small mite that gets under their skin. They lose their fur. They lose all the ability to um, self-regulate. And that's when we see actually the most conflict situations occur. And they're not so much conflicts, but just people see them much more frequently. So we had a, a particularly bad round of mange in 2015, 2016. Um, so there were a lot of sick coyotes. Because they lose their fur, they lose their ability to self-regulate their temperature. So that's why you'll see them laying on pavement and driveways and, and porches, because they're trying to keep warm. Um, you'll also see them going, being more bold, I'll say bold, um, to get food because they don't care. They're just, they're eating garbage, they're eating anything they can find, but they're sick, so they're not aggressive. They're just trying to find something to eat because they smell so badly. That's another component of mange. They can't even get close to a, a small mammal. It smells it from miles away. Um, so let's see. Oh, the biggest actually, the, the main... Uh, uh, cause of death in coyotes in urban areas is uh, vehicles and collisions. And then, uh, of course, mange, which I just mentioned. There are a few other diseases. They are not particularly prone to uh, rabies. They're not considered a vector species. Um, so that's pretty much the, with injury and illness and the sorts of things that will, uh, I guess, for lack of... Uh, there's no predators, but those are the things that do tend to uh, take coyotes out of the ecosystem. And again, if we use poisons, so this is one of the, so starting to talk a little bit about why we take the approach we do. You start looking at, at poisons, um, even rat poisons. You know, There's a whole chain of uh, events that uh, happen. So, if an animal is poisoned, it, it gets through the whole ecosystem. Uh, and we don't want to start doing that. So establishing appropriate boundaries. We talked a little bit about um, that, about keeping, we do need to keep spaces for coyotes where it's normal and natural for them to be, so to speak, um, which is more in our, uh, like our uh, natural heritage system, the ravines. Uh, and we do want to keep them away from our uh, residential areas. So, but things like trails, parks, hydro corridors, these are kind of, these are areas where we kind of need to keep a bit of an eye on it. Um, things like bird feeders, as I mentioned, uh, 
sloppy bird feeders are a big attractant for coyotes. Uh, Leash-free parks, uh, that can be a bit of a, a, an issue if you're leaving your dog off-leash outside of that park area. Um, improper garbage handling is another problem. Uh, so we do encourage people to not put out their compost until right before uh, garbage pickup that morning. Uh, construction site, there is a lot going on. Uh, and this has actually been the source of a few of our uh, denning issues. We've had uh, two that I know of, both related back to uh, the original uh, den site, which was on uh, basically a, a, a construct, like an old house that was had been abandoned or, or vacant for several years. So the coyote thought that was a good place. Uh, and then construction would start. And then that animal sort of mid mid breeding season would need to uh, moved to a new place and was kind of desperate, which is where we start to end up with problems such as uh, dens in uh, culverts or gullies because that's like a last ditch kind of a, it's been forced out of its home and it's trying to find some place to put their pups. Um, oh, and that's another one as well, um, is people going down south and leaving their homes uh, vacant. Uh, while they go down south, which might not be as much of an issue this year, but it's certainly something to uh, keep in mind that if you do that, uh, to make sure that somebody is looking uh, after your property and not allowing uh, those animals to take up residence uh, in your absence. So fencing and canids, uh, or actually fencing and uh, uh, coyotes. Coyotes can scale, uh, they can jump actually uh, at least six feet, but if there is any sort of a grip on the fence, like a chain link fence or uh, boards, they can certainly pull themselves up. So fencing, and they can also dig. So fencing, while um, is a, you know, a bit of a deterrent, should not be used as uh, a complete uh, sort of a safety net, or you shouldn't think that it's a safety net that if you leave your pet unattended in your backyard for any length of time, that it is going to be secure from a coyote. Uh, most, in most cases, they won't make that attempt, but if that is a hungry coyote and you've left it out for a long period of time, there was, I know, one incident uh, which was really unfortunate. Uh, it was a family that uh, backed onto a ravine. They had their, coy or their dog got tied up to a post uh, while they were out, and unfortunately, uh, it, that animal didn't have a chance. The coyote did jump the fence um, and had a, a meal, and that dog couldn't go anywhere because it was literally tied to a post uh, beside a ravine. So those are the kinds of things, again, it's, um, it's heartbreaking, and that's why we really want to ensure that that doesn't happen to uh, other residents and that you understand that this is a possibility and to make sure that you take the proper precautions. Um, again, it's not just coyotes, it's uh, wildlife of all sort. We strongly discourage feeding. It is, creates unnatural um, uh, systems. They get more food than the, the natural area can support. Uh, so they start breeding more. So there's not a natural food source. So you're gonna get overpopulations if you start doing that kind of feeding. Uh, it's not healthy for them. And it does have the potential to spread diseases, so again, strongly discourage wildlife feeding in general. So uh, I won't get into this in too much detail. Um, this, uh, because we've talked about a lot of these things uh, already in the presentation. Uh, again, this was uh, a situation where it was a conflict situation that was set up that really didn't need to go that way. Uh, previous interactions with dogs, as mentioned, can heighten a coyote's uh, sense of, uh, uh, I guess, concern, especially around pupping season. And uh, again, when coyote parents are displaced by things such as that construction or uh, you know somebody coming back from, uh, from a trip to Florida and, and then, of course, the coyote leaves. Um, so they're going to be extra uh, alert, on edge, defensive, uh, and it's primarily towards dogs. So when you see 
or hear about people that are walking their dogs by some of these sites, that's when you're going to get the greatest reaction. We've talked about that. And again, I, again, just personally, I know uh, I've come across that frequently where people will have their dogs off leash and have actually said that they enjoy letting their dogs off leash because it's good exercise, because they get to chase the coyotes. Um, Again, that starts to set up very poor conditions. Um, again, these are all great uh, things. We've got a lot of information on our website that I would strongly encourage people to access. Uh, if you want any sort of tips for your pets, uh, it's generally pretty basic though. And we do have bylaws. Dogs on leash, off-leash areas are great, the off-leash parks. Um, we have several of them. And if you do have your dog in your backyard, keep a close eye on them. And another piece with that, the uh, aversion, and condition, aversion conditioning and hazing. So coyotes are, they are like dogs in many ways. They're very trainable and they're very adaptable. So the way that you set up your environment and the way that you train, like basically train those coyotes is how they will act. Um, so if you can train that coyote to know that people are not something that, that is, is good, that they're scary, that's a good thing. And it needs to be done consistently. Uh, it doesn't have to be everyone in the community, but there has to be enough of a, an effort so that the coyote understands that. Um, you can use your voice, be loud and assertive, body language. And I've heard this from other people um, that they've waved their arms and the coyote didn't go anywhere. So the idea though is that if, if you think of it, uh, if you're standing on one side of the street and you're walking down the other side of the street and somebody across the street starts waving their arms at you, you're probably not gonna take much notice of that. Um, but if that person starts waving their arms and starts crossing the street and running towards you, you're gonna be very concerned and probably get out of that area. It's the same with the coyote. Um, again, their biology is such because they're normally, they've, they've, they've evolved, they're not pack animals. They, even though they hang out in some family groups, they are solitary animals which means that they can't look after themselves if they get hurt. So that is their basic biology, is to run if they think there's a threat. They won't run if they don't think there's a threat. So you have to make it threatening enough that they're gonna run. They will not attack, generally, if unless they're cornered. If there's pups, do not do it then. But you have to keep that behavior up until they go. You can't do it from far away, like really far away. You shouldn't do it if you're in, uh, for example, if you're going off the trails and you're in some naturalized areas, don't do that to the, don't haze a coyote there. That's where we want them to be. Uh, you haze coyotes if they're in residential areas or places where they should not be. Um, seasonal, water hose or water gun. I know one of uh, the uh, wildlife removal companies that we've worked with, uh, they said that that is one of the best ways uh, that they've found with coyotes for themselves and that's on a personal basis. Um, can have some fun with it, get a super soaker, not for everybody, but, uh, and even things as simple as a large garbage bag, which folds up in your pocket, it doesn't take any space up, and you snap it. Uh, that's a particularly good one. Um, and there is the potential for, for training, uh, for hazing. The town does have uh, some videos, and uh, there is the potential that, uh, uh, you know, we can certainly work with different groups to uh, provide additional training. But the big thing is too, is prevention works, which means also keeping those attractants out. Um, if you do feel threatened, you should pick up uh, pets, small children, but mainly the pets, uh, a coyote, because then that starts to make that pet part of you and the coyote is not going to go after a large, uh, a large person. Um, Stand, or stand still, quickly use a sort of gesturing. You can shout and wave, slowly back away, um, and never turn your back and run. So again, we talked a little bit about that, um, when to haze. It's not every time you see a coyote, it's if they're in a place that they should not be. Um, hazing uh, also must include site investigations, and it's not just a standalone action. Um, if there is a problem coyote, uh, please, uh, we, the town would be working with the community and we would be also looking at other things uh, such as, again, removing attractants, making sure that there is community education. So it's all part of a, a more fulsome program. 
And again, don't haze uh, coyote families with young pups. Uh, they are going to be protective as any, uh, as any animal would uh, over their young. So I think that's, oh, actually, do we have time? Just for five, like five minutes, I just wanted to talk quickly because there, there isn't anything here. But one thing we didn't really talk that much about was um, trapping and relocating because I know that's something that a lot of people ask us why we don't do that. Um, there's lots of reasons. I'm just going to give a really high level uh, talk about that. So trapping in an urban area is very challenging. Uh, a lot of th the majority of trappers, quite honestly, will not do it. Uh, there are too many barriers. So things like uh, people do let their dogs off leash. And if we put uh, traps in trails or in areas that are uh, publicly accessible where a coyote might be, that could be uh, a person. It could be a dog off leash. It could be a dog on leash. It could be other uh, wildlife, such as uh, you know rabbits, raccoons, possums, uh, that get caught in that trap. So that's not something that it, we want to do. Um, there's also uh, restrictions uh, around uh, certain, like we, we would either use a lethal trap, uh, which again is, is a bit of a problem because that's, that can be very dangerous. Uh, and live traps are not uh, likely to catch anything. Uh, Caitlin is going to talk a little bit about how difficult it is to catch a coyote. Uh, that's almost impossible. Uh, also, the whole uh, idea about just taking coyotes out, uh, whether eliminating them or relocating them, they can travel up to 500 kilometers over a few days, and they will, they're always, like, there's always uh, coyotes looking for a new territory. If you have everything the same, the same conditions, that there's lots of food, lots of uh, habitat for them, there will be a new coyote in the area very quickly. Um, and it's going to pick up the same bad habits that that other coyote had unless things in the community change. Uh, there's also the whole issue of firearms. We cannot use firearms. Uh, the only ones that are authorized to do that is police. And again, the, the danger in that is exponential. And with the actual risk, the scientifically proven risk to people is so minimal from coyotes that balancing that with what impact trying to trap a coyote or kill a coyote would be in an urban area uh, it just does not make sense. And it's also been tried in a lot of places and been highly unsuccessful. And as far as uh, tranquilizing and moving them to another place, there's a lot of rules and regulations around that, uh, not the least of which if you live trap or live catch a coyote or any animal, uh, you have 24 hours in which to uh, put it back to where you found it, and it has to be within one kilometer. So you cannot relocate animals for lots of good reasons. They, that would spread disease. It would spread uh, that issue to another area, and chances are that animal would make its way back eventually or try to, to make its way back to its own territory anyhow. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's a lot of reasons around uh, why we do the things that we do, um, and again, that, that's why uh, I would encourage people to access the town's resources to learn how to best manage coyotes uh, because they are here and we can't do uh, very much as far as eliminating them unless there is a significant issue with a single particular animal. Um, and even that, we've had situations like that in the past, uh, tried to catch it. Uh, and in the process of trying to catch that animal, had hazed it so badly that we retrained it anyhow, uh, but it was a significant effort and we never did, were able to catch the animal. So um, anyhow, with that, I will turn it over to Caitlin. Actually, uh, yeah. if I can, I think I'll, we actually oh, have sorry. a few questions that yeah. have come in. So uh, Donna, if you can uh, maybe provide some information for us. One of the questions is how many pups are born each year? Oh, so. It, it depends on a lot of things, but uh, it could be anywhere between two, and I believe, and this is from Leslie, had a picture I know in one of her other presentations, I think there was 17 pups, which is incredibly unusual. Most of those died. On average, uh, I believe around here, it's about five pups per year. There's usually at least a few that do pass away. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, anywhere between five to seven. 
Excellent, thank you very much. And are you able to, one of the other uh, questions submitted was, how many coyotes are in southwest Oakville? Um, we don't know exactly. We do know that uh, there are what's called, something called carrying capacity, which means that you're not going to get huge numbers of animals moving into one particular area unless there is enough food and habitat to support it. Um, people may think that there are a lot of coyotes. On average, in urban areas, I think that the average territory in an urban area is between five to 10 kilometers squared. So that would be a, a pair. And they would be within that area. You're not going to, they would have their pups and then they would move out uh, over the course of the, the year. So uh, we could guesstimate just based on square footage of the area but uh, we don't have exact numbers, but it's, 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 we're not overrun with coyotes. Perfect, thank you very much, Donna. We appreciate you stepping in and, and no pinch-hitting for us. Yeah, sorry for any... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Uh, so we will uh, welcome Caitlin, and actually before she starts her presentation, we do have a couple of other questions. Uh, one of the questions was, how do I protect my pets? And I know that was uh, one of the, the slides that Donna had, had gone over. Uh, if your pet is in your backyard, uh, please remember that the fence is not enough of a, a barrier to keep your pet safe. Uh, you really do need to make sure that you're, you're out there keeping an eye on a pet uh, just to make sure that uh, they, they don't um, have any negative interactions with a coyote. Uh, and if you have a small dog and you're walking them, please, uh, as, as was on the slide, stop, pick up your pet, uh, and that way that pet becomes an extension of you. So that pet will, will benefit from your large size and ability to scare that, that uh, coyote away when you're yelling at them and waving your free arm. Uh, another question we had was uh, about the use of, and, and I'll say firearms. The question was really as far as the use of pellet guns and paintballs and slingshots. So to be clear, I, I want uh, residents to understand that pellet guns and paintball guns are considered firearms within the town of Oakville. Uh, and they are not permitted. Uh, as was um, part of the earlier presentations, uh, only uh, police are, are really allowed to use uh, firearms unless uh, they, there's an exception under the existing bylaw, but it really is primarily police. Uh, and I will ask Caitlin to follow up on the slingshots and just the, the impact to the animal. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the other important things to recognize when it comes to tools, um, firearms such as those in terms of slingshots, is there is uh, municipal, provincial, and federal legislation in place pertaining to um, cruelty to animals. Um, so it is not permitted for those uh, actions to be taking place because they can ca cause harm or damage and you can be charged uh, on either of those legislations for causing distress or permitting distress to those animals. And that does include wildlife as well as domestic animals. Um, and it does pose a safety concern to individuals in the community as well. So we always recommend um, proper hazing techniques that would be more effective in terms of making sure that the um, coyotes are leaving and understanding that they are not welcome in the current um, position that they are and to stay away from those kinds of um, mechanisms. Perfect. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, there has been a follow-up question to the pet in the backyard, and I, I just want to, um, to make sure people understand because I know our pets are very near and dear to our hearts, and we want to make sure that they are safe. So, again, a, a fence is a bit of a deterrent, uh, but if you do have a, a small dog and it's out in the backyard, please do not leave it unattended. Um, making sure that you are loud and waving your arms is, is one method. Um, and as uh, Donna had mentioned before, there are other method, methods. There's using a hose or a water gun, if you're comfortable with that. There's using an umbrella uh, where you can open and close it rapidly and making lots of noise. Using a garbage bag where you can snap it uh, to scare that coyote away. So there are a number of different methods and, and certainly uh, if anybody has uh, additional questions, uh, have a look at our website, uh, oakville.ca. There is a hazing video there that uh, hopefully can provide some technique. Uh, and if you have additional questions, certainly uh, phone in and, and talk to staff. And with that, we will go ahead and introduce Caitlin Jones back again, Manager of Animal Control with the Oakville uh, Humane Society, and she will do our final presentation tonight. 
Thank you so much, Selena. I appreciate the introduction. Um, like Selena mentioned, I'm the manager of the Animal Protective Services with the Humane Society here in Oakville. Um, and I'm going to be speaking today a little bit about our involvement with wildlife, uh, specifically pertaining to our role with coyotes. Um, so just in giving you a little bit of information pertaining to um, what we do for wildlife. Um, we employ a team of animal control officers who are trained um, to respond to calls for sick and injured wildlife um, only, so we don't actually uh, respond to calls for nuisance wildlife or anything like that. Um, and that would include uh, animals that are orphaned or abandoned, in need of medical attention, general welfare. Um, we offer that service uh, to respond to calls 24-7. Um, so we always have an officer, even if it's in the middle of the night, we have somebody on call uh, able to respond to emergencies to make sure that those animals are taken care of and aren't left in distress. Um, and we are contracted by the town to fulfill those duties. Um, in terms of our role with coyotes, um, I know that it's difficult because there are um, a obviously all of us here that are speaking to you today that have a little bit of um, a piece uh, when, when it comes to speaking to coyotes. Um, so I definitely understand that there can sometimes be confusion in terms of who fills what role, and I'm hoping that today's um, presentation and what Selena spoke to earlier um, will speak to clarifying who does what. However, that said, we are very much an educational reference to the public. When you think about a humane society, it typically comes as top of mind for any animal-related issues. Um, so we are more than happy to uh, provide the education that we know and the experience that we have to residents. And if there's a question that we're unable to answer, we are an, a good organization. We have a central hub of um, places where we can direct you to uh, get those answers as well. For coyotes specifically, we would be responding to calls uh, for sick, injured, or abandoned. Um, Donna spoke to this a little bit earlier. One of our primary responses to sick coyotes would be pertaining to mange, um, and she described it a little bit. I will go in a little bit more detail um, in terms of what that can actually look like um, on a coyote. I'm sure um, you know if you've had the opportunity to see a coyote with mange running around, you can see that it's not looking like its best self. Um, it's missing a lot of fur. It's very, very itchy. Um, might have some open wounds as a result of the scratching. Um, sarcoptic mange is a parasite that lives under the skin, as Donna mentioned, um, and it causes um, the coyotes to not thermoregulate. They could be running a bit of a high fever. They might not know exactly what's going on, and they might not um, you know, have all of their wits about them in the same way that a perfectly healthy coyote would. Um, we would respond to all of those calls. Mange is very, very treatable. One of the issues with it is that it uh, smells very bad. So the prey can actually smell coyotes from a large distance away. Um, sometimes you'll see squirrels, they'll run up in the tree and they'll call out to warn all the other squirrels to get into the tree because there is a predator around, which in this case would be the coyote for them. Um, and so they have a much more difficult time finding food. Um, so they are obviously very opportunistic and may look for fruit droppings, bird seed, everything that was um, detailed earlier. Um, so basically what ends up happening with mange is the coyote doesn't eat as much, becomes a bit more um, lethargic, and then we try to obviously capture and contain those uh, coyotes to make sure that we can get them the help that they need. Mange is very treatable. Um, so oftentimes if there's no additional injuries, we will, um, transfer those animals once captured to a licensed rehabilitation center for treatment. Another type of call that we would popularly respond to pertaining to coyotes is um, them being hit by car. So we would um, make sure that they are um, seen by a registered veterinary technician that we have on staff um, to assess the condition to see if they are eligible for uh, rehabilitation for that. As well as some of the younger coyotes, um, if they are abandoned, we will respond for those calls as well. Um, some of the additional responsibilities that we have here in the town is we do hold the contract um, for animal control. So we do enforce the animal control bylaw uh, and a component of that is for um, pets, so off-leash dogs specifically. If we have reports of a densite or coyote, a highly active coyote area, we will 
Um, if there's parks in the area, we will set up patrols um, to monitor for off-leash dogs in those areas to make sure that that's not going to be a behaviorally contributing factor um, to enforce, to enforce the, that legislation. So the great question that we have been asking ourselves for years is how do you catch a coyote? Um, Donna went into great detail uh, speaking to um, the ineffects of tranquilizing guns and things like that. Um, I do want to take an opportunity to mention that um, when it comes to tranquilizing guns, I think that's probably the most common question that we get from members of the public is why can't you just dart gun them um, and sedate them? And unfortunately, it is more so something that is predominantly viewed on television. Um, there are a lot of factors as to why that's not the safest or best option, especially in circumstances such as ours where we're trying to capture a, an animal that is not fully healthy. Um, so what ends up happening is the tranquilizer gun uses um, a sedation, um, and depending on the size of the coyote, the condition of the coyote, for example, one with mange that might not be of a high body weight, um, it might not be able to metabolize that and it could be a fatal response. Something else to consider is it takes highly trained individuals um, to be able to utilize uh, tranquilizers, um, typically veterinarians who are trained on dosages um, and then obviously it is a firearm which as we learned is a restriction here um, within the town. So um, I think something that's really important to consider is also if we think about what that tranquilizer does and how that process would look, if you were to say dart a coyote, um, that dart hitting the coyote is gonna be, it's gonna startle them, they're gonna get scared and they're gonna run. Running through a suburban area with a dart that has sedation going through it, um, we don't know where that coyote's gonna be and then we only have about 20 minutes to find it before that sedation wears off. Um, so it's not effective in that sense. So we look to other methods um, to try to capture them. So I have some photos above here. Um, you can see some hand tools that we use. The first photo there is our glorified tool. We call it the hoop net. It is a glorified hula hoop with a large net um, that you can toss and hopefully gracefully land on the coyote. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. It often gets stuck in the shrubs when you're running after them. Um, also, the catch pole. Um, we try to get several officers on scene um, if there is an instance or report of an injured coyote because um, we work with positional advantage if we're able to kind of corral them into an area um, that we can get a tool around them to be able to contain them. That's the most effective. Additionally, um, we have uh, another photo at the top there is uh, a trail camera that we will set up if we know that there's coyote, um, injured coyote activity that we're trying to capture. Um, so we would use that trail camera um, paired with a humane trap. Um, something to consider with the humane traps, coyotes are so intelligent, they're so adaptive, and I know we've heard a lot about that this evening. Um, something to consider is the smell. They know the smell of our vehicles. They know the sounds of our trucks. They know um, the smell of our equipment, the look of our uniforms. Um, so it's kind of, and we speak to hazing a little bit, it's kind of um, hazing in and of itself because if we're trying to capture a coyote, we're hazing it and they know as soon as they see us, they, they are conditioned to run away immediately um, before we get any opportunity where they might not do that um, with somebody else. So. Um, we will set up traps. We use descenting spray. We try to make it um, as natural of an environment as possible, and we will leave it there for a couple of days if there's a coyote that is in that area to make it look um, kind of to blend in, and so they get used to the idea of that being there and not being something that's dangerous. The other thing we consider is, is what do you bait a humane trap with for a coyote? Um, well, in some cases, we have uh, resorted to roadkill because that is, um, carrion is something that they eat, and it is a large attractant for them. We have tried things such as KFC chicken, and we have not been successful. So um, we have as you can see that coyote in the trap in the photo there, been able to successfully utilize this method before, although it is very difficult and is only um, likely going to take place uh, with a coyote out of desperation um, because they're so hungry. So those are some methods that we use. And here I have um, some numbers <laughs> over the last several years of coyotes that we have successfully captured. I think it's important to take a look at um, 
the breakdown of that. So in the first column, we have coyotes that we've been able to successfully capture over, since 2014 up until uh, the end of May of this year um, that were alive, um, deceased, that ended up having to be humanely euthanized or that we were successfully able to take to rehab. Um, most of, I will say that most of the deceased coyotes that have been picked up are typically um, hit by car. Um, so as you can see, there's not a, a huge number of them. Um, they're small numbers, but we're proud of them because uh, for behind every one of those numbers, that's hours and hours of us on foot chasing after and putting in um, obviously the, the effort to try to get these um, beautiful creatures safe and able to be sent to rehab so they can um, be back into the environment that they thrive. Um, one more thing that I really wanna touch on this evening um, is not only um, coyotes, but our personal pet ownership responsibilities when it comes to coexisting and living with coyotes. Um, some gentle reminders and things to consider is to, and I know most of these have already been spoken about uh, today, are pertaining to uh, dogs specifically. Always keep your dog on a leash regardless of their recall ability or behavior. Um, it's the bylaw in Oakville, unless you're in a leash-free park or on your private property, they do need to be on a leash. Um, avoid dusk and dawn. As we've learned today, we know that coyotes are opportunistic. They're not necessarily diurnal. They're not necessarily nocturnal. Um, they're going to be out and about when the food source is available to them. So um, that could be, um, we do still frequently see them during dusk and dawn. So if, you, if there is a time in your neighborhood that you find that you're seeing coyotes, maybe try to adjust that to a different time for your walks with your dogs. Um, carry deterrents such as whistles, umbrellas, branches, air horns. Um, the one thing I will say about whistles specifically is if you live near a park or a sports field and coyotes are used to hearing the sound of the whistle, that might not be an effective um, hazing tool. Um, my personal favorite, which I find to be the easiest, most effective, is the bag trick. Um, and it doesn't have to be a garbage bag. It can be um, just a grocery bag. It fits in your pocket. If you're using that as you know, a dog waste bag, <laughs> you might have one of those on hand anyway. Um, and you can just do a, a quick snap. It's a really um, abnormal sound that coyotes wouldn't necessarily be used to um, and can you know, let them know that they need to back away. Um, find a walking buddy for you and your dog and always supervise your dogs when alone in backyards. Um, dogs are more so seen as predators towards coyotes, not, ne not necessarily food sources. However, um, something to consider is, you know, if you, if you are aware that maybe, just to give an example, maybe your neighbor has been feeding wildlife intentionally or unintentionally and a coyote comes and there's a food source next door, that dog could be seen as a threat to that food source. So we want to be able to um, consider that as well. And that's why it's very important to report uh, any behavior such as that. In terms of cats, um, do not allow your cat to roam off of your property. Um, that is also a bylaw here within the town of Oakville that we respond to. So if you do have concerns for cats um, that are running at large and you know where that cat belongs, you're more than welcome to contact us and we will um, help to address that concern. Um, do not leave cats unattended on a tie out. Um, if there are coyotes present in the area, Donna spoke to this as well already. If they're on a tie out, there's no ability for them to escape. Um, and there are so many other um, countless threats that are out there for your pets um, that are not necessarily just coyote based. So you've got, you know, you've got the poisons that are out and about, you've got cars, um, anything like that. And especially with those tie outs, not to be graphic, but they're the cat could potentially, or a pet could potentially get stuck on something, and because it's around their neck, it could be problematic. Um, so it is a nice consideration. Um, so yeah, so just, just some kind of, to tie everything up, just make sure to, to, to do your best to be as responsible as possible. Um, and I am available if anybody has any questions pertaining to um, our involvement with that. So thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it and I hope you learned something. Terrific, thank you very much, Caitlin, for that presentation. So I will now look uh, to see whether or not we have any questions uh, that have come in through the Q&A or through the phone lines. Okay, so no questions at this time. 
Uh, I want to thank all of our presenters today and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation and, and you were able to take something away. Uh, please refer back to our website uh, if you want to have, that, have a look at the video of hazing uh, or if you have any questions, please feel free to contact uh, Municipal Enforcement. We're happy to, to share more information about uh, our procedure and, and, um, and any techniques that you have or answer any concerns with uh, coyotes in your neighborhood. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, have a good night and uh, take care. Which guy?